So assume that we have some legitimate property. I have some right to some object. So as a matter of justice, I'm entitled to use that thing and determine how it will be used, for what purposes. And suppose now that you violate that right. So suppose now that you are unjust by what? Taking that object and now using it for your purposes. That's what it means to be unjust. It means to violate something that somebody has a right for. I have a right to the thing. I have a right to use it as a means to my end. You are using force to take it away from me and to use it for your purposes. Okay, for Kant, my right to that thing, my right to that object, survives your physical control. Even though you have the thing, even though you can physically use it, I'm the one who rightfully gets to decide how it's to be used. It's still my property, even though it's in your possession. I still have a right to the thing. My right survives that physical uh, separation. And so, what follows from that? I can still use that object for my purposes. That is, I can take it back from you. So, physically, I can come and grab it. And if you try to stop me, I can push you out of the way. That's mine. I'm the one who gets to decide how the thing is to be used. So the authorization to use force follows from the entitlement to use that thing as means. Um, think of another thing. I mean, the, the other example that I gave was I'm entitled to use my body for my own purposes. And if you come to attack me to use my body for your purposes, my right to my own body, my right to use my body for my own purposes entitles me to try to stop you physically try to coerce you into not using my body for your purposes. That's what it means to say that I have a right to use it for my purposes. So there's not a sort of second step here where we then apply a second moral principle. The idea of being entitled to use the thing physically for your own purposes is, is what the right consists in. So there's an authorization to use force in the sense of just using the thing. Okay. Um, I think that's all right. Um, sorry, so uh, let me just say one last point about that. Notice that my taking the thing back from you or my physically defending myself against an unjust attack. This is not a matter of punishment. This is not a matter of deciding you are a bad person and therefore ought to be punished in some way to make up for it. It's simply an application of the positive right that I have. Um, okay. Let me just say then a few things about the doctrine of virtue. Um, so he starts out here um, with a familiar point that morality can't be grounded in empirical feelings. Um, but then he asks, why is it that it has to be on guard? But then he asks, why is it that people can continue to insist that morality is grounded in happiness? Why is it that people continue to insist that somehow or other happiness has to be found at the basis of all um, And the answer that he gives is that acting morally really does generate a certain kind of feeling in human beings. So there is, he says, um, at 142, he says, um, when a thoughtful 
human being has overcome incentives to vice, empirical desires, and is aware of having done his often bitter duty, he finds himself in a state that could well be called happiness, a state of contentment and peace of soul in which virtue is its own reward. Okay, so the reason why people often think happiness or feeling has to be at the basis of morality is because when we act morally on things, the, the result of that often is a feeling of contentment or satisfaction, feeling good about yourself. Now, he says, a eudaimonist says, says this, this delight, this happiness, the feeling that you get when you act morally, is really his motive for acting virtuously. So the eudaimonist says that what people are really going for when they act morally, is that feeling. That feeling of contentment or satisfaction. The concept, the eudaimonist, his opponent says, the concept of duty does not determine his will directly. He's moved to his duty only by means of the happiness that he anticipates. So on this view that Kant is rejecting, people are moved to act uh, in a good way, morally, because they know that they'll feel good about themselves after they do this. But Kant says this can't be, because a person is only going to feel that contentment, only going to achieve what he calls moral happiness, if he does his duty for its own sake, not for the sake of that feeling. Um, and so we can see this we can test this maybe by imagining that there was a pill that you could take that would make you feel like you've done the right thing. Make you feel good about your, uh, your actions. Now, uh, imagining that pill, imagining that test, is a way of distinguishing two cases. If you are moved simply by the feeling if your end is the feeling that you get when you do something good, and this pill would give you that feeling, then, obviously, uh, you would be perfectly happy, perfectly content to take that pill to get the feeling and avoid all of the difficulties of actually acting morally. That would be the easier path. And if that's your goal, that's what you would do. Now, surely, sometimes that is what motivates people. Sometimes people do act simply in order to get that feeling of content or satisfaction. But in that case, look, it's obvious that they don't really care about the people that they would be helping with that virtuous act. If they would just be as content to take the pill as actually acting virtuously to help other people, well, they don't care about those other people. They only care about that feeling. And that action is not virtuous. It's not morally praiseworthy. So if the goal really is simply the feeling, then that's not a virtuous act. Um, so in order to actually be virtuous, in order actually to be a moral person, you must care about doing the right thing because it's the right thing, for the right reason, for its own sake, because you recognize that that action really is good, like helping other people, for example. Now, of course, Kant is not very optimistic that this is, in fact, often the motive that people have. We certainly can't have any empirical proof about it, um, but he does think that we have the capacity to act virtuously. We have the capacity to act because of our recognition that that's something that would help other people, not simply because we would feel good about ourselves if we do. And therefore, the requirement of morality that we do that is expressed in a categorical imperative that we must do that, even if we don't always. Um, okay. Um, 
good. So here's a quote where he says, the doctrine of right was concerned only with the means expressed in our external action, but ethics goes beyond this, provides a matter that is an end. It's concerned that we have the right goal, that our ends are proper. Um, so two last points then. Um, Uh, two last points. And the, the first is that as a matter of justice, as we saw, we can be constrained to act justly. So somebody can force me to act in accordance with, to keep my promise. Somebody can threaten me with something that I really dislike. If I break my promise, that be, might be enough to get me to keep my promise to be just. So justice and right is something that's subject to external constraint, external coercion. But morality is not, because morality is concerned with our choosing the right ends. And we cannot, Kant says, we cannot be constrained by anything outside of us in our choice of ends. Um, so others can force me to perform an action, but not to have an end. Only I myself can make something my end. So notice that when somebody is threatening me with punishment if I break my promise, and getting me to conform to what uh, justice requires, that presupposes that I have my own end, like not being harmed, like not being um, hurt. And, and what they're doing is they're using the assumption that I have that end of avoiding harm to myself in order to get me to behave properly. They're not giving me any other ends. They're constraining the means that I have at that point. Um, so because morality, because ethics, is concerned with proper ends, this is something that's not subject to external legislation. It's not subject to external constraints. We can't, we can, we can make somebody be just. We can't make somebody be moral. All right, so last point. Um, morality is concerned with having the proper ends. That is, having the ends that are required by morality. And so, these are necessary ends. These are ends that are morally required. These are ends that are duties. And these ends, Kant says, are one's own perfection and the happiness of others. Uh, all the way since the beginning of our discussion of Kant, I've been emphasizing there are no empirical ends. There are no states of affairs that all of morality is aiming at. And this is consistent with that. Because one's own perfection is not a state of affairs. And the happiness of others, even though it does involve um, uh, empirical desires of others, uh, is, Kant's not as clear about this as he, as he should be, but it's their permitted happiness. It's only their happiness that's consistent with morality itself. Um, so, um, perfection for Kant is cultivating one's faculties, including our will, including our moral sensitivity. Happiness concerns other people's permitted ends. Um, and last point, because morality is concerned with these ends, not the proper means to them, the law, he says the moral law, cannot specify precisely in what way one is to act and how much one is to do by the action for an end that is also a duty. So in other words, what justice requires is um, never violating the rights of others. Only doing what justice allows, what is right. Virtue tells us we have to have certain ends, namely the cultivation of our own perfection, our 
capacities and the happiness of others, but it doesn't dictate exactly which actions to take in pursuing those ends. We have some, Kant says, free play in deciding when and where and how much to pursue those ends to integrate those ends with our own permissible ends. So virtue, so morality, isn't going to have strict requirements in the way that justice does. Okay, I'm sorry that was very rushed. Uh, we'll start on that.